This is Jason Reed Pratt, author of Cry of Justice. Have you ever wanted to be the first among your groggy friends to make a video about the newest war game to be released which you think isn't a piece of trash? Um... <gasps> me too! Fortunately, on Saturday, or maybe Friday night, I've slept since then, I bought Desert War 1940 to 1942, designed by BK Word Games and published by Matrix Games, also known as Slytherin Games in Europe. And while I haven't gotten so far as to actually play the thing yet, I've read enough of the tutorials and Quick Start and Main Manual to have something to talk about in introducing the game, so here it is. As you might gather from the title, the game covers early North African World War II operations down to the end of 1942. There is no campaign per se, just a set of operational battles. But it's a good mix, and for introductory purposes I'm skipping the tutorial battle and going straight to the earliest mission, Operation E, or Operazione E in Italian. This was the first major operation by the Axis, specifically by the Italians, against the Allies, specifically Great Britain, with help from India, on the North African front, and as the subtitle suggests, the Italians still weren't ready to invade Egypt by mid-September, but High Command worried that they needed to try anyway. So early on the morning of September 16th, here we Commonwealth Allies are in northwestern Egypt, expecting from intelligence estimates that the Italians have massed just over the border around the port city of Bardia, ready to invade. I know from the mission description that I can expect the computer, playing the Italians this time, to have 209 various regiments and battalions and companies and batteries, along with some headquarters out there, stacked up in this area, ready to go. Against them, I only have 109 pieces, a little less than half their numbers. And that number is misleading, because almost half of my pieces are fixed on the map until later. That's, well, these pieces back here, which I'll zoom in on a bit. I'll zoom in more soon. The yellow, orangish, and reddish hues to the hexes around the pieces represent how much control they're exerting, separately and together, over nearby hexes. I like to have them on, to give an idea of how hard it will be for enemy pieces to get past and around me, but I'll turn them off until later by pressing the Z key. I have to press it twice because the first time toggles over the axis zones of control, which can't be seen right now anyway. The bright yellow hex border remaining shows where the camera is currently focused in the game. It moves around according to where I left click the mouse, and this can scroll the map around too. I can also toggle the mouse pointer with the keyboard's X key to slide the map around as I mouse over to the screen borders, but for demonstration purposes, I usually rather the map stay locked in place until I move it. You might be able to see some bright blue lined hexes too. Or you could if I remove the chips from the map. So I'll click here and then here and do that. This makes the chips transparent. You can see they're still there and even some idea of how far they're stacked. Those blue areas are supply sources, which can also be captured and used by the enemy. If I zoom the map out and scroll it over here, you can see bright red borders on those hexes at the port city of Bardia and on a road onto the map. Those are access supply sources. This game requires players to make sure their pieces keep open trails back to supply sources in order to fight well. And you might notice when I put the pieces back on the map that my first defense here against Italian invasion is a long way from my nearest supply way over there. Fortunately up here in the town of City Barani I've got a mobile supply source which picks up and extends supply chains out farther. But only as long as it remains connected by the road network. Or doesn't get overrun by the Italians. Capturing this supply dump and city is going to be the first main goal for the Italians by the way. Let me back up over here to the city of Mursa Matra, my rear base area, and let me remove most of the chips on the map. This button allows me to see only the headquarter chips, keeping the others transparent. But with my T key on the keyboard, I've toggled a pop-up that shows all the pieces stacked in a hex, even if they're transparent. But for this introduction, I'm going to stick with the headquarters. I'm selecting this piece first. The abbreviation for each piece's name is down on the bottom, in this case, WDF. I happen to know that stands for the Western Defense Force, which is a core. 
So I won't be flickering the tooltip all the time, giving us all epilepsy. Or I could just toggle that off with my T. Let me right click on this and open a window explaining what everything on the chip means. Here we can see a fuller version of the name, although this is still somewhat abbreviated for other units. And below those three allied markers or dots, it says what unit this is, a core headquarters. And below that, it would show any piece in command of this piece, if there was any. There isn't, which means this is the boss piece on the map. I assume everyone watching this video knows how modern armies are divided up, but just in case, armies are made up of multiple cores. There are evidently armies in this game, but not in this mission, so everything on my side belongs to the authority of the Western Desert Force Corps. Each corps, including this one, typically has authority over multiple divisions. Usually divisions have authority over multiple brigades, brigades have authority over multiple regiments and or battalions, different nations organize their battalions and regiments differently in relation to each other, and some only have one or the other. In this game, for the British Commonwealth at least, regiments and battalions both answer directly to brigade headquarters. I don't think there are any headquarters in this game below brigade level, but technically battalions and regiments are each supposed to have local headquarters, and then those have authority over multiple companies, and company headquarters have authority over multiple platoons and batteries, and those have authority over squads who have authority over sections. I don't think there are HQs farther down than platoon in real life, if that far, and in this game they don't show up anyway. You will find a few platoons and a lot more gun batteries in this game, but they're all treated as answering directly to brigade headquarters or possibly to headquarters of divisional or core strength. You can see one divisional headquarter piece here, the 7th Armored Division and a few brigade headquarters like the 7th Armored Brigade here. The number of X's across the top tells you what level they belong to in the army. And X's are shorthand in the name abbreviations across the bottom too. Going back to our on-map boss, WDF Corps Headquarters, the three little allied dots here shows the level of quality. Most units in this mission I think are regular quality, so have three dots. I'll roll over here and you can see that units can be total newbie conscripts with one dot or elite with five dots and anywhere in between. I'm not sure yet whether units gain experience and level up in this game during an operation. The number in the upper right corner indicates how large the piece is, so to speak. This one is size three. I'm not sure yet if there are larger pieces, although I kind of doubt if they get above four. The smallest pieces, like these brigade headquarters, are size one. The size reflects how many slots, so to speak, the piece takes up in a hex. Each hex has eight invisible slots, and this limits how many pieces can be stacked in a hex. No more than eight in any case, but the limit might be less depending on how large the units are. A core headquarters spreads around a lot, so it takes up a lot of space. The unit size also translates to how much it can control passage of enemies through nearby hexes, the zone of control. Level 3 size grants level 3 zone of control, and while the smallest one size unit barely extends any effects around it. The least and most experienced units also generate less and more control over surrounding hexes for their size. So a size 1 elite unit would have a zone of control of 2 around it. As a general rule, a unit size also translates over directly to how much anti-air defense they can throw up against scouting or attacking planes. 3 in this case, just like the size. The other headquarters have anti-air of 2 or 1 based on their size, see? Obviously some units are better than average at anti-air missions, like an anti-air battery, which has three times its size and effectiveness. Others might be worse, I don't know yet. The big flag in the middle either shows a NATO symbol, HQ in this case for headquarters, headquarters or a picture if I toggle that. The color of the flag indicates the nationality, more or less. British Commonwealth forces usually have this peach-colored flag, whether they come directly from Great Britain or not. But if I scroll over here, you'll see some white ones. Those are from India, but they still count as United Kingdom Commonwealth forces. We have at least one free French unit off to the west, too. They have a dark blue flag on their chip. The big red F means this unit is fixed in place on the map, unable to move, either permanently or until the release is triggered on a later turn. The rollover tip says this unit can't move for 12 turns, or until turn 13. However, this unit next to it has a green F, which means that during the setup phase I can move it around at least a little, but it will be fixed in place afterward. 
We'll get back to this idea later, probably in another episode. The dot on the right tells me whether a unit is in good supply or not. Green means yes. This hedge hedge quarter. This her, this this headquarter only gets supplied directly from supply nodes, or maybe also from mobile supply nodes. So the green means it can trace a clear path back to the nearest such one, and not too far away, right next door in this case. The basic underneath tells what kind of supply is currently assigned. This isn't something that shows up on the chip itself. All units start each turn automatically assigned to basic but one of the functions of a headquarter is to regulate what kind of extra supply units under it will get. Extra fuel or extra ammo. This gets drawn from the surplus stock up here. We start with 88 extra fuel and 74 extra ammo. Each turn on this particular mission will automatically restock a fourth of each of those. So four turns to fully restock from zero. Full stock would allow the core to send all valid units either one extra ammunition for attacking with or one extra fuel for moving on the roads. A unit can't have both, and some can't have one or the other, or even not either one. So there is never any need for more than the starting stock, I think. The big 24-8 on the chip refers, for headquarters, to how far out it can push supply, 24 movement points in this case, and to how many movement points the chip itself has for spending in a turn to move, 8 in this case. Most other chips, the numbers stand for attack value, then defense value, and then movement, with three numbers. If a unit starts with 100% strength, that's the clenched fist, or the bottom green dot on the left, then those big numbers will be at their maximum. As the unit takes damage, that rating will degrade by proportion to the percentage. In this game, it's impossible to restore a lost health, so to speak. That happens to some degree between missions to units that historically survived. So as health degrades, the maximum values of those big numbers also permanently degrade by proportion. The last number, in green dot currently for this piece, shows the readiness of the unit. This affects a number of factors, including the big numbers, and reduces their current maximum values, which themselves might be degraded by further percents as the readiness degrades. And a unit's readiness is degraded by practically everything. Movement, attack, being attacked, don't you know, just anything. But this drop is temporary and can be restored by resting on a turn. It also restores somewhat between turns, proportionate to how far away the unit is from its HQ. And what's left? Okay, these icons across the top right of the pop-up show a few other things. This ditch and gear icon shows the unit has some temporary entrenchment. Not big permanent entrenchment like on the map over here, but not just standing around in the open either. In this mission, all my units will start entrenched. The gray weird crack thing here signifies whether the unit creates shock when it fights. Headquarters don't. I'm not even sure they can fight in this game, so it's grayed out. A company of tanks would definitely have a black flag with yellow lightning here. We'll get to shock in the next episode. Last, every unit, as usual in strategy games with Fog of War like this one, which, like in most strategy games, can be turned off, has the ability to see whether the enemy is nearby. This unit's clarity, or power of sight with a clenched fist, how well it can understand what it sees, is only rated 1, which I think is the minimum in this game, not 0 as in some games. Not entirely sure. The distance rating next to it is also 1. It can see out only 1 hex away. A scouting company might see three hexes away, and with three strength in understanding and reporting enemy details, which I expect is modified by terrain and similar factors. In this game, headquarters are primarily ways to route supplies to the other chips on the map. The WDF there sends out supplies as far as 24 movement points away, to a few units under its direct command, but mainly to subordinate headquarters, like the 7th Armored Division. That turns around and sends its supply on as far as eight movement points away to any of the units directly under its command, like divisional artillery batteries, but mainly to brigade headquarters, which then turn around and send supply down the line, another eight movement points, to all the other units on the board under its command. In real life, this might go to regimental or battalion headquarters, then from one of those to the other, depending on national army organization, then from there to company headquarters, then from there to platoon headquarters, if those exist. But the game doesn't go that far. Consequently, a big goal of any fight is to break the lines of communication between fighting pieces on the board and their headquarters, 
or between lower and higher headquarters. This progressively eliminates the will and ability of units to keep fighting and helps them be destroyed more quickly. Headquarters are also and similarly responsible for deciding to request and distribute extra fuel or extra ammunition for the units under their command, either to move faster on the roads, that's the fuel, or to fight more strongly during attacks with the ammunition. In this game, such decisions are all or nothing. One regiment of a brigade cannot get extra ammo while another regiment of the same brigade gets extra fuel or nothing extra. Everyone under that brigade gets extra fuel or extra ammo or nothing extra. This is something I wish would be changed in the programming code, but that's how the rule currently is. For division, corps, and army headquarters, I don't have one of those on the board, they can choose between sending extra supplies to fighting units immediately under their command, like infantry garrisons or artillery reserves, or sending all of the extra to all the headquarters, and from there to all the fighting units downstream of their command. If the Corps Headquarters for this mission orders extra ammo, extra ammo will be distributed to everyone on the board, or only to the few units directly under its command, my choice. Third, headquarters are an important way for units to regain readiness between turns. This helps simulate the need for fighting units to stay in communication, especially physical communication, with the headquarters, so it's important for units not to get too far away. Fourth, while in this game headquarters don't quite provide bonuses to attack and defense, with one exception, which I'll mention in a minute, pieces will lose efficiency in attacking, or usually in defending, if they are combining with pieces from other headquarters. Uh, down here, the 4th Armored Brigade has these pieces nearby under its command, and the 7th Armored Brigade has these other pieces nearby. Those sets of pieces could team up to attack or defend a heck t together with these sets of pieces, but if they do, then the chain of command will get a little tangled about which brigade is supposed to be giving what orders to who, and they'll fight a little less efficiently. But at least they all belong under the command of the 7th Armored Division up here. The farther away, I mean organizationally, not in distance, although I guess in distance too, the different chains of command trace, the more of a penalty to attack and defense for units teaming up in a fight. The highly organized Germans are the best at minimizing this problem, and the British are next best, and different armies are less good to various degrees down the line. And the tangle isn't as bad on defense as on offense. In fact, the Germans in this game get a 25% bonus if they have pieces under different but closely related headquarters defending a hex together. If these two brigades under this division were German, I'd want them to be teaming up together on defense. And on attack, they'd have no debuffs either. I don't know whether this is supposed to reflect something about real-life German tactical organization in World War II, or if it's a game-balancing thing. That finishes my overview of headquarters in this game, which introduces and talks about several wide-ranging game concepts along the way. But I've forgotten to clarify something I mentioned back at the beginning, which I'll finish up with. Here in the setup phase, all pieces are assigned to starting areas of operation. These are all in the light blue area, which you can tell by the little light blue triangle down in each corner. I can turn the overlay for these areas on and off with the Q on my keyboard, which I'll do now after zooming out with my mouse wheel so you don't get a big light blue blast in the face. So light blue here and a mauvish sort of patch next door. There's an Indian division with a little British help guarding this area, this mauve area, which is the road to off the map through the city of Fuca to Alexandria, Cairo, and the Red Sea Canal, which the Axis would like to get a hold of, especially Italy, so as to help their goal of recreating the Roman Empire. It's kind of pointless for these areas to be colored since all these units start out fixed, or mostly fixed, with a little pre-game positioning leeway. Over here to the west, though, is a big red blotch showing the deployment zone for all the units inside it. And I can move all, or almost all, of those units around during the setup phase. I'll do that in a later episode, but topically I would want to make sure I'm not snapping my supply lines with my headquarters and from my headquarters and through my headquarters when or if I move these things around during setup. You can also see two grayish areas over here. That's where the Italian team starts. I can't tell, unless I study the Italian setup, of course, how many areas those are divided into. This one might be one setup zone, or it might be two, or three, or even four. I don't know. Probably Bardia is one zone, and outside Bardia is one or more. 
Again, over here near the edge of the map, is that one zone or more? I don't know. I also don't know how many troops will be fixed in place to start with, or free to move around and set up, and free to move up for attacking on the first turn. Probably a lot of them, but Italy wasn't really ready to go yet. And I happen to know that one of the headquarters will only get one movement point a turn for a while to simulate Italy needing to build a decent road to Bardia, even though that's a permanent map feature. Anyway, I'll be looking at the types of fighting units I've got available to slow down, if not reverse the Italian tidal wave, next episode, when it will be time to talk about tanks, among other units. Doom, 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 doom,